Center Street, Provo, Utah. Uh, this meeting is being broadcast live on the web on the Provo City Council YouTube channel where it will also be available for on-demand viewing. Please be aware that the microphones in the room pick up the noise of paper and other rustling objects as well as side conversations. Although this is a public meeting, only the presenters and those seated at the council table may speak or ask questions unless otherwise invited by the chair. We'll begin with a roll call. Mr. Strachan. Cliff Strachan. Brian Jones. Dave Pax. Gary Winterton. George Hanley. Elizabeth David Hardy. Kate Embryo. Bryce Mumford. Dave Sewell. George Stewart. Wayne Parker. Great. Uh, the opening prayer will be provided by Mr. David Walker. Our eternal and loving Father in heaven, Father, we're grateful for this day that we have to be here. We're grateful for our opportunities and our responsibilities as stewards in thy kingdom. And we're grateful for the chance we have to be here to help plan for and work for the betterment of Provo. We pray, Father, that thy spirit might attend us to help us, to guide us in making the best possible choice. And we pray for thy spirit to watch over all of those employees this day who serve thee by being out and about amongst the community. May they be protected and safe and return home to their loved ones. And these things we pray for in the name of thy Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Walter. And you, we want to just hang out there. As I, I, no. Thank you. As I introduce the first item, which is a discussion regarding the resolution authorizing the Chief Executive Officer to enter into a lease agreement with Blue Sky Development to allow them to utilize parking spaces for a mix, a pending mixed use project at 105 East Center Street. And Ms. David Walker, our redevelopment agency director, will be leading the presentation. Thank you. Um, so this is a proposed mixed-use development at the intersection of 100 East and Center Street. We've been working with McKay Christensen. Initially it was Red Sky, he's changed it to Blue Sky, so... Um, <laughs> well, you know, Red Sky at morning, or at night, sailors, you know, I think that's why he changed it. I think it was in the wrong plus valley. I think it could be. Could be. Okay, there we go. So, um, he has been purchased. Oh wow! He's been purchasing. He purchased the property at the former gas station, and he is uh, developing it. As I said, mixed use. He's going to have commercial on the ground floor. Maybe it works for you. Ah, so here, this is this is his proposal. He has purchased the property. He has gone through uh, planning commission, and community development and he's getting ready to start the process. He's going to have a <coughs> ground floor that'll have commercial, which is will be retail and office, primarily restaurant. We've been talking to Mr. Kevin Santiago about a couple of concepts to bring into downtown Provo. And they don't have a mixture of studio one and two bedroom apartments. They are proposed to be market rate apartments. He will um, park all the residential on site, but he is requesting access to the agency's allotment of parking spaces in the Wells Fargo garage here in order to meet the parking for his commercial needs. Um, as a quick background, the agency received an allotment of 204 parking spaces in the Wells Fargo's parking garage as a result of the assistance the redevelopment agency provided in the construction of the Wells Fargo building and the garage. Um, previously, the agency has worked with 63 East to provide parking spaces for the residential units there. Um, there are 55 spaces at 63. They're right in here. So there's a walkway to the building. The residents park here, walk to their building here. And then also, uh, when the developer was going to do 80 East, which would have been located here, they were interested in renting another 80 spaces, leasing in 80 spaces from us. That project was approved. Well, let me say the lease was approved by the redevelopment agency, but the project never went forward. 
So those 80 spaces are kind of in a holding pattern. We have been told that Provo City Housing Authority has reached out to the developer and is interested in acquiring 80 East and will build the project there. But uh, at this point, they don't know that they would use all the 80 spaces that would be available there. I think it's important to point out that there's been some other interest in the agency's 204 spaces, primarily from uh, the owners of the Los Hermanos building. Uh, they are interested in rebuilding. They would like to keep a, res a restaurant on the ground floor, the office space as it currently exists on the second floor, but add two additional stories of residential. And they are <coughs> they're talking to us about the possibility of having uh, spaces here in the Wells Fargo. And then also, Mr. Brad Sears of REM has, <coughs> as in the past, had a proposal that would called University Towers that would wrap around here and be a 15-story office mixed-use structure again. But he would have some parking inside, but they would also need access to these to the agency space, some of the agency spaces in that building. Um, Mr. Christensen, let me see if I can get So here's, he's going to have about 7,000, 7,200 square feet of ground floor retail. Um, he's going to have some amenities for his residence as required under the code. Um, he's looking to have restaurants on the ground floor plus some office space, real estate office space. So he thinks he's well positioned here to take advantage of all the other, all the other activity that uh, has happened in the downtown Provo area. He thinks that's going to be good for him. And this is proposed what is he's proposing to look like. Yeah. Keep in mind that these are uh, a little older. He's gone through a couple of revisions since then, but this would be. Now, this would be his ground floor space here, and then he would park all of the residential units interior to the project. He's going to have a parking structure that will hold all the residents. <coughs> the resolution before you today, um, let me back up one more step here. So the agency received these 204 spaces when the Wells Fargo structure went through uh, a bankruptcy hearing. There was a court-appointed receiver, Mr. Duncan Lambert, Lambert of Coldwell Banker Real Estate. Uh, we have been trying to reach out to Mr. Lambert and his attorney, and we haven't had a chance to make contact with them yet. And so the resolution in the staff report at, is asking you to go ahead and approve the, the concept of, of, of assigning, assigning a lease agreement and giving the Chief Executive Officer of the Redevelopment Agency the authority to make some minor changes provided they don't, you know, don't make subst substantive changes to the document or the deal points. Um, our, our arrangement for the parking structure spaces expires in 2044. At, what, at which point? Who has the ownership of it after 2044? I think that goes. I, I think it goes back to Wells, the Wells Fargo ownership. You said 44, right? 2044, yes, sir. 25 years. <coughs> that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. It seems like there's a number of developers that want to use our parking. Yes. Instead of building their own, why don't they build their own? Because this is much less it's expensive. And who do you who do you give the uh, who do you give the advantage to if there's two or three that want to first come first serve? So far, that's you know that's been the case. Okay. I mean, it, it's good to be to have it used to get paid for it, but I guess you had unless you had some other competing developments that you felt might be better, you utilize that parking that you take first come. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a clear proposal from the owners of the Los Hermanos property. They, they're interested. They would definitely like to do it. Mr. Sears of REMS uh, in the Knight building, he has a he had a project that was called University Towers 
which was approved, I believe, in 2007 with the redevelopment agency. However, funding for that project came from the Central Business District project area, and that project area sunsetted, well, our ability to collect tax increment from that project area expired in 2015. Therefore, we did not have a funding source to assist Mr. Sears in the development of the project, and we terminated the agreement. Mr. How many spaces are Blue Sky interested in? They're interested in 55, I'm talking with um, community development, they figure he, they would need about 36. How many spaces are they providing for their residents in the house? In their own building? So it should be on this part of it. They have 54,000 square feet of parking that are that will be, as I said, interior to the, the project. Um, there's a second box there, right here. 100, 130, 132, plus another 13 on the street. They're showing 13 on the street, but I think that's. I think they've been told since then that they couldn't count that. So it's 132 that provide each other. How many units of housing? How many residential units? 124. 124. Don't do that right. Uh, 126. 26. So one space. There's barely over one, one unit. Yeah. So initially he was talking about on the ground floor that all of it would be re re restaurant, so that would uh, put his count a little higher. But he's I mean, there have been some give and take on that going back to community development. So we, we got an email from Austin Taylor recommending that we allocate uh, only the 36 to the code. Um, what, what's your feeling on that? It, that seemed to make sense given the demand from various parties for the spaces. I, yeah, I, no, I, I think that's uh, entirely logical, given the the interest from everybody. And if we were going to to utilize it to its maximum extent, if we the 36 spaces would leave us, you know, if you assume that 80 east, which had 80 units, if that if you don't include those in the calculation, doing the 36 for blue sky would leave us a net of 33 spaces in the project after you take out 63 East, 80 East, and Blue Sky. So that's still so my- you're referring to the Wells Fargo? Yes, yes. Part of the 204, yes, sir. 30. So, yeah, on the 204, if you would, 55 for 63 East, 80 for 80 East, 36 for Blue Sky would leave a balance of 33. Or if you did the 55 that he's requesting, then it would be a balance of 14. So, the 33 spaces would probably give you the option to help the Los Hermanos property owners in expanding their, their project. Because they would do, I, I'm just guessing that they could probably get four to six units on the third and proposed third and fourth levels of their building. Does that leave anything for the northeast corner project? Very little. Just it. I mean, it would depend exactly on how many spaces we would need for uh, the Los Hermanos property, and I don't have an exact count on that. But it would leave anywhere between zero and fifteen, I guess. Yes, sir. Um, I'm trying to understand what this would look like. Um, do you don't for the. 55 stalls that are already used uh, or rented by 63s. Um, what do those look like? A placard that says reserve parking, or how does that? Right now, they're not allocated out except for some, some for Wells Fargo itself. Okay. So it's kind of on a first come, first serve basis. And the other whatever it is under or so right now are open, open. to the public. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so is it possible that someone can be in public dwelling in a park there that residents of 63 East can't? I have not, I have not heard that that's an issue as yet. Okay. The nice thing is since it is residential, it kind of offsets the time for the office use. So we haven't had a whole lot of, I have not heard of any complaints. Okay. You, you may not remember, but we did a while back process a, an amendment where we tra where PEG purchased 63 East from Forge Development. And so those units were transferred over to PEG and PEG has not reported any, any issues with having no parking for the residential people. I, I have heard of an uptick of usage, which I think is generally a good thing because of our wayfinding, way, mm -hmm. wayfinding signs. And so I think the public is more aware that there's currently free parking there. Um, I imagine at, in the future, if it gets to be a problem, they'd be within the rights to be assigned some stalls and to put up, or, or, are, we, or are we simply just talking about you know, we have parking minimums, they need to fulfill them, they can give some money, and we'll deduct them from these public ones, we're not going to manage it, and we'll just say, okay, you're good on parking. Yeah, yeah we haven't really charged, uh, I think we're only charging $30 a month for the parking space. For 63 East? Yes. Or, okay. So, in, for the for the proposed Blue Sky, it's kind of a sliding scale to help him get started and help the restaurants get started. But we're not proposing to allocate, I mean, dedicate a space simply because, you know, we're not really getting rents that would have, that would cover the cost of maintaining those spaces that way. Does that make sense? Did I say it right? But right now, <coughs> the same stalls are being used by the public. Yes. And so it would be less available to the public, but with it not being managed, it doesn't necessarily look any no, I don't. It's, at this point, we don't envision that any any change is going to happen for the public who drives up and wants to, to park there. What's the current? It's 25 years now. Is the, is the yes. current request? And I imagine in 25 years that could change very. It it could. So I think it would change. yeah. So um, if you remember when Mr. Earl got here, he is planning to be able to wrap his parking structure with additional leasable space because in 25 years he figures something will change. Either the public transit will be to the point where it'd be more advantageous to use that or people will be using shared park shared cars instead of shared parking. I don't believe that you know in our case when we planned the Wells Fargo that wasn't planned for. So in 25 years we may be looking at a reuse for the parking structure. Right. But in, in the meantime I mean, in five years it may be the public demand has gone up sufficiently that the residents and the restaurants say, well, we're, we're paying for these spots, yet our, our customers can't find any parking there. And, and the residents say, well, we're paying $30 a month for these spots, and there's, they're not available, and so we may have to go to... We may have to go to a managed system. A managed system. So, so here, here's here's my discomfort with this. I mean, okay. So, so we, we participated. We got these 204 for economic development, mm -hmm. and so I I fully support using them, maximizing the, their value, and and encouraging economic development. So, I, I, so I think I think there's alignment there on this. Um, we were invited to go back to Lincoln, Nebraska, as part of the Duncan Correct. study. <coughs> And that was a fascinating tour of the Duncan facilities, but I think the thing that I learned and walked away from that experience that, that you know, most fundamentally struck me was how Lincoln, Nebraska treats downtown parking. Okay. So I, no, I, I agree, and I think Lincoln, the, you know, Lincoln's model is, a, is one that we should, could learn a lot from, where they, they have roughly seven parking structures in the downtown area, and your first two hours within the parking structure are free. If you choose to park on the street, you pay for that. And they have provided a variety of ways for you to do it. You can do it from your phone, you can do it from a credit card, you can, you can do it from cash. Um, they kind of have some similarities with us in that they are university town as well. And uh, so on Sunday, Saturdays rather, when uh, football teams and playing a home game, they, 
they get slammed downtown. So, so, so thank, thank you for that, kind of describing the system, how that runs. But, but what I was going to mention was that they view downtown parking as a city service. So they don't have minimums when, when people build new stuff. They don't say, well, you have to have this much parking. They, they view downtown parking as a, as a city service that the city pays for, finances, manages, collects revenues from, and, it, and is, that's how they participate in, in, their, in their downtown. And part of our parking, uh, strategic parking plan that we had, um, was some of the options that we were given was to go towards a more managed, so rather than saying, okay, you're building this, you're building Blue Sky, I'm sorry, yeah, Blue Sky, you need to provide this much parking, it would just be, okay, you, you're, you build that, and and I don't know if there's assessments or whatever, but then the city will take care of, of parking and make sure that that's, and, and, and it seems like that's, we started taking some steps towards that when we're looking at our, our um, assets in the town, uh, Provo Town Square garage, in the Marriott garage, um, in the Wells Fargo garage. Um, I'm just wondering if, if, if we're moving towards a more managed solution, which I think there's some value so we can get the full usage of these, of these spots by them not being reserved. I wonder if tying up 36 or 55 of these, of these stalls for 25 years, I wonder if that's a step in the wrong direction. And, and it, you know, I'd be interested, I don't know if it's a possibility of saying that you can lease them for the, the you know, up to 25 years, but if we change systems so where you're not required to have parking, then we can take them back. So the resolution in the staff report asks for the authority to sign an agreement once it's finalized. So we have not finalized it yet, so we can certainly I mean, if that is the direction of the, the council and the agency board, we can certainly incorporate that into, into the deal and, and future deals moving forward. Then we have, we've had several opportunities to, people wanting us parking. Um, do we sign the deal and make it effective as of building permit time? Because we, are we tying up and not allowing others to use I think it? it would be certificate of occupancy. If, if, you know, I mean, we would make the parking available once there's a certificate of occupancy issued for one of the commercial or restaurant spaces. But we're committing to it now. Right. And so how long are we tied up for that if it, if it doesn't go through? We've had a few other opportunities to do that, and people wanted that. And I just hate to say, okay, we'll give it to you now, and then have it three or four years down the road. Before we could put in a sunset clause that if he does not pull a certificate of occupancy for the office or our restaurant space, that within, I don't know, five years, then that would, the agreement would terminate. If that's, I mean, if that if that's the direction the council would be comfortable with, I just hate to give it away and not get anything for it. And there's other people that would like to use it. And maybe their project will go. Right. I mean, I guess the question is, if we if we want this development on the block, we better provide parking or else. I mean, if we yank something like that, then all of a sudden we have a problem on our hands that we don't want either. So it seems to me we just got to decide if this is what we want. I mean, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to feel hand tied exactly, but 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 if we don't if we don't like the development and we want something else, that's that's a different set of questions. But if this is the development we think we want, um, and this is the best offer we're going to get from them, it seems like we, we it's in our interest to provide these spaces for them, that brings them in. This is a development that potentially brings a lot of benefits to downtown, and we get revenue from the parking um, that I presume can be, uh, you know, devoted to, uh, I mean, does that just go straight into the general fund? Where does that money go? 
Yeah. And yeah, it's not slated to go it's anywhere. It's not slated. You, 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 mean, you could go into the downtown. Yeah, I mean, if we just say we, we're going to reinvest that into downtown and, and parking being one of the issues uh, that <coughs> we're continually worried about. I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with the, what was the number? So I, Austin's 36. email didn't actually specify the number, but 36, 36. is the best. Yeah. If, they're, if they're okay with that, that gives them enough breathing room, that gives us enough breathing room, that seems like a good compromise and we get, we get some revenue. I, I believe it does need to be conditional. We've, we've seen a lot of projects, uh, with a lot of fanfare, and then it doesn't go anywhere. And if we just uh, tied it up for the next five or ten years and the property sat there, that'd be unfortunate. Um, or actually, if we signed it for some, uh, whatever, you know, 25 years, and, and then it's just always tied up with that property. Okay. I, I mean, we can have that. We would be happy to have that conversation. If I could ask the council uh, and maybe Mr. Jones a quick question. This item, I believe, is also noticed for tonight's agenda. Given, I mean, this is a little more of a substantive change than in waiting for an, an approval from an outside entity. I don't know if that is something that we need to continue for tonight or and bring it back or. I think that's up to the council um, right. as far as how comfortable they are with the current draft and what they want done, right? I mean, they can either, uh, we can amend the resolution and approve it tonight uh, with some instructions in the resolution about what the council wants changed in the draft before it gets executed, or, or if they want to actually see the changes, then they will wise to bring it back. So, it, for our conversation earlier, it feels like a lot of this is just checking the box. They have to provide so much parking. They don't want to do it on site. We have these spaces that are just open to the public, being used now, open to the public, and say, well, on paper, we'll lease them to you for you know, not a fairly small amount of being. It's, it slides up to, to be yeah. something you know, reasonable. Um, but we're basically just like checking it off and saying, well, you can count these, so now you don't have to I, I, yeah, I don't know if it's a checkbox for us so much as for his financing. Mm -hmm. So there have been cases where uh, financing entities want to say, you know, what what are your parking requirements, particularly if you're going to be a restaurant? Mm -hmm. What you know, how are you going to meet your parking? What what's the required by the city? Show us how you're going to do that before you can get your financing. So it, it could be a checkbox, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a checkbox for us. So so, although in this case it probably serves for both. For me, and I agree with the Councilor Henley that um, you know, I think we've already we're already quite a ways down the road with this development. I, I feel good about this development. I don't want this to be a barrier to them, but I also we, we have seen projects stall, and I, I would I would hate to see you know we, we give it to them for the 25 years at a fairly small rate and. And this is where I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even sure what they can do with them. I mean, if, if at some late point this is managed, maybe they can then turn around and they're renting them. They're, they're subleasing them to someone else for sixty dollars a month. Um, and you know, so it's not really, you know, and, and that's still a gas station. Um, so that kind of worst of both worlds. I would love to to have this. So we're saying that yes, we'll, we'll enter an agreement that these these will. Um, satisfy your requirements but at a later time if we change how we manage parking downtown and how we require minimum parking spaces downtown then then we're able to take those back um, as long as we still you know guarantee that they meet their requirements that we're not gonna we're not gonna give them any new requirements or whatever that, that kind of so as I, let me just recap so that I make sure I understand. So what I'm hearing that the council would like to see is if we change our parking ratios or our parking requirements, then we have the ability to take the spaces back. And when I say change, that's either we eliminate the minimum requirement or we go to a managed parking system. And then secondly, that there is a termination, an outside termination date where if you don't a certificate of occupancy for a commercial space in the project within five years, then 
the, the parking arrangement and then would then also terminate. Is that is that a good synopsis of what you're thinking at this point? If I was a bank, that first one would cause me to pause just a little bit. The second one it wouldn't because I, as a bank, I wouldn't be putting money into it until it was done. But the first one, they can pull it out, and how, how will that affect my my, my investment in you? My investment in it, my security in this thing, because if they don't have parking, how will that do with? I I'd, I'd, I'd be a little bit take a little bit of pause on that first one. But the second one, I think it's important that we get. There's been comments about limiting it to 36 instead of 55. I think I don't know if that's a feeding of the whole council. If that ought to just be noted too, or I, I think so. I, I agree with that. Yeah, that's that, yeah. I thought that was. But I mean, so the two the two inclusions that I that I summarized real quick. Those those are that's the council. The direction the council would prefer to go to in this situation. Can you restate the first one? That if the city council uh, in the future goes to either a managed parking system in the downtown area or changes the parking minimum requirements for development within the, the downtown, that the agency would then have the right to renegotiate the parking arrangement with Blue Sky. And I think that's a, that's kind of an area to explore, you know, to see what what is what makes sense, what's reasonable. See, that's to renegotiate is different than pull. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, the concern about pulling it is what I was saying earlier. Then you just you, you just created a problem. Right. You know, you've you've built, allowed the structure to go forward, and then you're not providing parking for it because you're. So I, I don't feel comfortable pulling it, threatening to pull it, or me, you know, expressing the need to pull it, but renegotiate. I mean, it may be that, you know, over time, this is such a well-situated place for walkability that it seems to me that, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a completely clear sense of what kinds of, and it says luxury apartments, one to two bedrooms. So, In some these studios. are studio, yeah, so, I mean, these are, pretty comfortably within one car allowance, right, without needing to go. And of course, if that's essentially what you know going in when you purchase uh, in, uh, one of these places, then that, that's kind of what you're, you're going downtown so that you can have access to the walkability and to the public transportation. So you don't need to be driving everywhere. Um, so I mean, I can see it getting to the point where they don't even need those extra spots. You know, not because they're not full, but because they just don't need them. Okay. So, um, yeah, we can we can go back and have that conversation. We, we would renegotiate um, the parking arrangement if we go to a managed system, or we re we change the parking minimum requirements in our zoning ordinance. And just sort of for your, your question earlier, I. Can I I'm, I'm happy to do any signaling that we need to in tonight's meeting or whatever to give him or the bank or whatever the confidence that you know, we would like, we will work with them to find a solution. We just don't know if what's before us is the ideal solution. But, but I, don't, I don't think anyone, I haven't heard any. No, I, I no, we I don't want this to go forward. We don't want to assist them with the party. Um, regarding any monies generated from those uh, spots, and forth. Mm -hmm. I would think it would be smart to keep that money separate from anything else uh, and dedicated to the maintenance of parking structures downtown that seem to be falling apart faster than we can generate money. Yes. That would be wise move. Excellent. You're well over time. Is there any final comments? Thank you, Mr. Walter. Okay. So is it coming back tonight, or, or do you want to continue this? That's. It. I guess I don't know how quick you can get a response from them. I don't know. I, we can try before tonight. I would. I mean, I. I think we've let Mr. Mr. Christensen know that we're interested in the project and we'd like to see it to move forward. But it's just. I'm not sure what kind of assurances he's going to need from us as this moves. Okay. 
Okay, when so we're adding it sounds like things. we're going to have to continue this tonight anyway. Yeah, I, I think definitely should be continued. I can't vote on it unless we have this the agreement written with all the things that we feel comfortable with. I move that we continue it. Uh, we, even what we were proposed uh, voting on tonight was at, uh, was not. It's a draft. It was right. draft. It's we're a basically draft. just saying we we like this draft. Right. So can you change that draft? <laughs> and, and what good? What does that do to us? Yeah, why? That's a good question. I want to reiterate why we were thinking. Is it to give that a reassurance? Is that basically the issue? He's getting ready just to to look for financing. I'm sure he's already found some. He's been talking to investors as well as uh, talking to equity as well as. Uh, <clears throat> loan financing and so I'm, part of this I'm sure is to give a, an assurance to those financiers that hey I, I have parking for this portion of my project. Well, I, I think he has an assurance that the things that we asked for are approved that he's going to get it. I think the discussion here, the, the notes in this discussion, the minutes would indicate that we're going to do it as long as he's willing to do this extra. So. Mr. Chair. And I would say, I mean, the resolution, you're, you're right that the resolution tonight contemplated allowing changes, but it specifically said that those changes could not change the structure of the deal. It was just, right. it was just minor wording changes. So these kind of changes would not be I think they fall outside that. by the resolution tonight. So depending on how you feel and what you want public, ex how much public exposure and stuff you want, I mean, if you know now that you're not going to vote on it, you are not going to proceed tonight. You certainly could entertain a motion right now to just continue it now. Not even open it up. Not even read it into the meeting tonight. Okay. Mr. Walker, what do you think of that? Is it, is it worth having the conversation in the, in the meantime? Or, or? I, I will try to get a hold of Mr. Christensen immediately after this. I don't know that he's available. But uh, probably... Yeah, he is planning to attend tonight. Mm -hmm. Well, it might be worth to have a conversation with him tonight, whether or not we will. Yeah, I would prefer that. Okay. All right. So, okay. So it's on the agenda, and we'll talk with him. But it doesn't, I don't see how we can pass anything tonight until we can do it tonight. Yeah. I would recommend that rather than the council possibly negotiate it in front of everybody, you've indicated what your interests are to allow Mr. Walters to go back and, and, and meet with him and then hopefully bring it back in two weeks. I think we should negotiate and maybe the ISA at all. So is there a motion then to continue this item? Again. <laughs> <laughs> so second by Mr. Van Buren. Any discussion on this motion? All in favor? It's unanimous. All right. And right off the bat, we get to start playing catch up. So, item number two is a discussion regarding an update to Pro City Code Title 10, making an amendment to the sewer and water chapters of the title. Uh, this will be presented. Oh. While he's coming up, can yes. we introduce our intern? Thank you. Uh, council members, this is David Rogers. He's our intern. Do you want to take 30 seconds and yeah. just introduce yourself? So my name is David Rogers. I'm originally from West Valley City. I just graduated from Southern Utah University and I'm starting my MPA through SUU online. So I'll be working here and doing my MPA at Southern Utah University. But I'm really excited. I've always had an interest in local government. I'm really, uh, I'm excited to learn. I'm excited to work hard. And I'm really glad to be here in Provo working with all of you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thanks for uh, introducing or welcoming. So I'd like to welcome the mayor and Mr. Paxman um, to me. And we'll turn the time over to Mr. Gary Calder, the Public Works Water Division Director. And we have this budgeted for 30 minutes. Cut that down to 25, we'd be grateful, but you, you got a full 30 if you need it. I will try to cut it down. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thanks for the opportunity of being here. Um, I want you to know I did bring a tie today. I was out on the construction site today, so I took it off. And then as I was walking up the stairs, 
look in the reflection, I'm like, oh shoot, and I didn't want to be late, so I'm sorry. Uh, you know, no, never make excuses when you're up in front of people, but uh, you know. George Stewart's my hero because he's not worth a so. <laughs> time. Um, I want you to know that uh, we've been talking about parking, now we're going to talk about code. So I hope I can keep you awake. <laughs> so uh, what we've done is, um, well first of all, let me begin by saying we are making changes to three of the, the codes in the water resources uh, section. And we have worked with city staff, and I have Rebecca Andrews here, I have uh, Skyler Tule here, I got Dave Torreson and Dave Decker, okay, from the Water Resources. We've worked together, but we've also worked with our legal department, Brian Jones, one of them, Bob Tremblay, and Robert West, as far as trying to simplify our code. And if I can make it a really simple uh, description of the code. The city code says what we can and cannot do. Next, we have our development standards, which help tells us uh, in an illustrative manner how to do what we can do. And then we have our standard drawings that are a visual description of how to build things. Okay, and what we have tried to do is take our city code and simplify it because in the past we have had information in each one of these sections and it's been very confusing for staff as well as developers to try to understand because there's been some competing information. So what we've done is, is try to simplify that. And we've actually taken information out of these three sections and put a lot of that information into our development standards. Now, David Day was here in front of you, I'm, I'm not sure if in November or December, and we actually made changes. You, you approved already some of those changes that we took out of our city code and put into our development standards. And so what I have in front of you today is those changes and so we have greatly if i can figure out how to do this which um, button do i push you just got it oh okay what we're going to be talking about is if you look in the in the code under title 10 these are the three sections that we are going to be talking about these three right here there we go okay fancy oh now those are the three that we're going to be talking about and what rebecca is going to hand out to you are copies of these two codes. Now, what's really amazing to me is this, we're down to, in this paper you're getting, we're down to five and six pages as far as our code. Okay, so it's very simple as far as what we're doing. Um, the pre-treatment part of the code, you don't have a copy of because this is like 75 pages and it's a very long part of the code. Um, the water, Water Resources is a very heavily regulated department, okay? We have to deal with drinking water standards, okay? Here are the water service part of it. In the sewer, we have to deal with our collections as well as our treatment, like our treatment plan. Our tree treatment program, this is where we deal with our businesses, our residents, as far as what is put into our system. This is the oils, the fats, the grease that get dumped into our sewer system. And so this one here is highly regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. This is uh, regulated by the Division of Water Quality. And this is by our drinking water. So these are three different divisions that we have. And so what you have in front of you is just those first two copies. And what we've done, like, if I can stress this again, we have tried to simplify our code, to make it very simple for everybody to understand um, I, then right here, I just got the front page. Um, what you had last in November, and if I can get this thing to move, is, and I got a copy of it, is our development guidelines. You've probably seen this. This is just the first page. Every year we come before you with any changes, and this is just the front page. And here again, this here is about a 20 page document. But this is the narrative of what we can and cannot do. And so if I could just um, help, help you understand some of these things, like for example, in this document, not the code, is where we specify the situations like uh, you're, we always are getting asked, can we have temporary list stations? Okay, that is in the development guidelines, not the code. 
okay, the private booster pumps that we get uh, requests for to go up on the benches, that's in, the, in here. We've taken these things out and tried to make it into different areas to help us understand. So what you have in front of you is, is a simplification of our, our code to help us as we work with developers. And so basically that is all I have as far as to help you understand this. I'm not asking for a decision to be made today. We'll come back in a couple of weeks to council uh, to have you approve this. So if you have any questions, we'll be ready for even more questions at that time. But uh, here again, we've gone over this with legal and uh, they have reviewed everything that we have done. We have taken things out, but a lot of the information that was in the, in this, in the code has just been transferred over into our uh, development guidelines. So if you have any questions, I'll entertain them. I told you it's an exciting subject. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm just curious, it, the things you, is there a, a document that you use to redline or to take out, show what was taken out, or do you have that document? The version that's in. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. The version that's I think in. You got, I think you got a copy it's of that. A, yes, okay. It's in our, that's the one that that's was. That, uh, yeah, that's a very thick document, and I didn't want to, to confuse you. But you had a copy that I originally okay. sent to you. That's what I, that's what that I, I will tell you this. One thing that uh, last fall, Dave Decker came to us and we had our development guidelines and he challenged our department to come up with a one page checklist that we could share with staff. And we took all this information and we were able to basically provide a one page checklist that we could share with staff as well as with developers <laughs> as far as I would say 90% of the information, and we're able to consolidate that and put that into a one-page document as far as the stuff that we thought was the most important that would answer the most questions. And so we have tried our best to, in our simplification, trying to make this so that we understand it as a staff and also help the developers as well as the residents that may be dealing with this as well. Um, so, 1002160, wasting water. Have we ever, what is the penalty for unlawfully wasting water? Have we ever applied it? I, since I've been here, we have not applied it. That I'm aware of, but we have it in there in case we need it, in my opinion. That's the purpose of that. So, uh, but I don't know if we have ever taken that. Rebecca, do you have an answer for that? So we didn't change that section of the code. Um, water conservation, you know, if, you, if you actually read that section, it's mostly focusing on wasting water for internal fixtures it really doesn't talk so much about like um outside water and you're wasting it into the road um, there are several things that we probably need to deal with as far as water conservation we did not tackle those with, those with these code changes um, we're focusing more on the development issues with these code changes so that is definitely something we need to look at in the future and mr connect to answer your question about what the penalty is any, any time the code says it, it is it shall be unlawful then by uh, Title I of the city code, that means it's subject to prosecution as a Class B misdemeanor. So I can tell the kids and the wife, or whoever's taking that long shower. Or <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you are just brutal. That was not the intent. The you can make the difference. List, list the internal fixtures. Um, yeah. You can do this. Congratulations. I can understand what that is in Brian's explanation. Thank you. That's well, it really is great. I mean, it's simple. We, we'll try to do it, and hopefully soon. I don't know when, but we, Dave Decker has been the main push for this. But you will still see any other divisions from the Public Works coming forward with their revisions as well. So we're the first ones. We're kind of the guinea pigs, if I could call ourselves that. But uh, or were the easiest ones, I don't know, maybe, but uh, we, are, we are here trying to improve our overall standard that we pre present to the public. Um, so reading through these, um, you know, we, we got the final version here um, in, our, in our materials, we had the red line version. And I was able to, to read and kind of skim through uh, 0.02 and 0.03 and, and see what were being what was being changed and and whatnot. When I got to 10.04, I'm not even, I'm not even certain what 10.04 is. Well, 
I wasn't. I, I, it was hard for me to see what had changed, in part because it was. It looked like it was about ninety-eight percent of this fifty-page document. Ninety-eight percent of it was read, meaning changes. So. 1004, basically, we had a section 1004. It was basically replaced by, if I could say, a template that came from the state, which came from the EPA. Okay. We did take it, modify it according to our old 1004, submitted it back to the state, then they approved it, and that's what was sent back to us. Okay. So here again, 1004 is what the regulation, and Skyler's heavily involved in this, this is the regulations we put on our businesses as far as what they can dump into our collection system. Okay, fats, oils, and greases, as well as industrial waste. Okay, and that's the regulation. This is the stuff that we have to end up treating down our treatment plant. And so that's why it's called the pre-treatment. So some of these businesses are required to treat that before it gets to our treatment plant because of the increased cost or the contamination it does to our system as it reaches us. And Gary, along those lines, we, and we can talk about this offline after, but given the, ex, the extensive nature of the changes, it might be easier for everyone to follow if we just repeal the current 1004 and enact a new one instead of trying to redline mm -hmm. okay. what we have. Uh, I'm because okay. the changes are so... Like extensive. I said, we're just we're here to yeah. learn, but yes, we can make that. We'll have a resolution for you in a couple of weeks that uh, you can and we'll fix that language as far as it goes. Rebecca sent me a draft, and I'll, I'll make that comment on it, just okay. a suggestion, and we can talk about it. Okay. okay. And, so, and so, at the very least, in two weeks when we're considering this for adoption, we will have a, a clean version that doesn't have the red lines. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yes, we can provide that. That would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? It doesn't look like it. Thank you very much. Okay. And thanks for helping us. You're welcome. Get back on time. Item number three is a discussion regarding the repeal of Purple City Code Section 26040, uh, presented by Mr. Ryan Jones, our council attorney. Okay, this takes more than five minutes, it's not my fault. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it rarely is. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, Elizabeth actually uh, found this and, and suggested it. We, and going through the code somewhere else, we just uh, she discovered a section of the code that's pretty outdated. It talks about the process for submitting items to be uh, code amendments to be uh, reviewed by the council, and it talks about them needing to be submitted seven days in advance and submitted to certain people. But we now have an online electronic workflow that kind of obviates and makes all of that redundant. So it was. Elizabeth and I conferred, it's our suggestion, we just repeal that section and update the handbook to reflect the current process for submitting resolutions and ordinances for consideration. Excellent. Are there any questions? Just thank you, Elizabeth, for finding this, bringing it to the list. Amen. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. <laughs> with that, we're on time again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you set the new bar for everyone else. <laughs> All right, um, item number four is a discussion regarding an appropriation for a temporary apparatus facility during the relocation of fire station number two. This will be presented by Chief Jim Miguel, our Fire Department Chief. Chair Hardy and members of the City Council, good afternoon. Um, I'll try to help you with some of that time also. I, uh, I, I got here and found out you guys were running on a little bit behind, so I was able to go get my time. <laughs> so, so, but you're uh, still our hero, George. <laughs> um, we, um, we're, we're here today to talk about the uh, the relocation of fire station two, as you know, we are re we are uh, we are getting ready to relocate it to the 3900 block of Canyon Road. We um, once we get it relocated, we will demolish the station and, and rebuild our our new fire station. As we have started in this process, uh, it's been it's been a little more difficult than we had anticipated, not because of uh, the personnel quarters, but because of the apparatus bay. Um, 
the personnel quarters, uh, we have we have worked with Layton Construction, and they do this all the time with uh, with construction trailers and those kinds of things. And so they have been able to arrange the rental of living quarters for our firefighters uh, on a 10-month basis, and then a a month to month if we go longer than the 10 months. And so we are secure with the personnel quarters. The apparatus bay, on the other hand, has become a little bit more difficult. Um, we, um, as um, we back up, one of the things that, that we have had a problem with in the fire department is apparatus storage. Um, even in building these two new facilities, our station one and our station two, we've been very, um, apparatus storage within a fire station is extremely expensive. And, and we have a need um, out at near Fleet, near the Public Works building, we have a need to be able to store fire apparatus out there so that we can store some of the off-season stuff periodically. We can store our, 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 uh, our summer brush trucks during the winter time. Uh, we also can bring apparatus to the shop and have it there, have it lined up basically to be worked on and have a building that if they need to move it out to, to get something else into the city shop, they're able to move uh, the apparatus into, a, uh, into another building. So we have been talking about um, a, a structure out there of some sort that we could utilize for that. As we uh, started working on this apparatus-based structure, um, we, we saw several different types of structures. Um, we thought we had a, a fairly good plan with a, a company called Sprung. Um, it was an expensive structure, but they offered a they offered a, a rental, and we were we were going to be set on potentially renting this. But the rental was uh, rental was about seventy thousand dollars to rent this for the period of time that we needed to rent it. In addition to renting it for that period of time, it was also necessary for the company. And, and I'm not speaking of this structure right here. I'm speaking of another type. Um, it was $65,000 for them to come out and erect the structure. And then when we were done, it was $65,000 for them to come out and take down the structure. And uh, the, the, the numbers took our breath away. And so we went looking for some options and we, we found this option. Um, what we have found is that uh, this option here is, is from a company called Big Top Fabric Structures. And um, the difficulty with this the difficulty with this company is they do not lease or rent their facilities. You have to buy the facilities. So um, we did some. We we uh, we got a, a bid from them, and um, the uh, as I said, we had a we had the, and the first structure it was sixty eight thousand dollars to rent. This one is a hundred thousand dollars to purchase. That purchase um, that purchase includes actually some additional things. That didn't come with that with that sixty thousand dollars, like heaters and some uh, some um, a vestibule to hook us up to our fire station, those kinds of things. So, with this hundred thousand dollar structure to own, as opposed to the seventy thousand dollar structure to rent, we also had a sixty-five thousand dollar construction price on the other structure. We have a thirty-seven thousand dollar construction price on this new structure. So, the uh, so the, the cost of this to actually purchase it and to have it set up on the site is, is just about $138,000. Um, we are here, I am here to ask uh, for an, uh, a general fund allocation to actually purchase this building and, um, and then when we are done with it, we own it. And we would take the building from, far, from the fire station number two site we would um, we would take it down, move it over to a piece of property either on the fleet property or very near the fleet property. We would reconstruct it. That's what the forty thousand dollars is, and we would have a we would have the additional apparatus space that we desperately need per square foot. It's as cheap ap <clears throat> it's as cheap apparatus space as you can possibly find. The building is the the membrane structure is guaranteed warranty for fifteen years. The the frame of it is uh, is um, warranted for 25 years. It has an R value. I think it's an R24 value. It's got an exterior exterior uh, lining. It's got an interior lining with with uh, insulation in the middle. And um, one of the reasons that we're here is because this 
this has taken us by surprise, and, uh, and I'll, I'll take responsibility for that. When we started looking into these structures, we were in the, in the $30,000 or $40,000 range for some of these things. When we determined what we were going to have to do to set those thirty dollars or $40,000 structures up, there was another forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of infrastructure that had to go in in the form of concrete floor and and uh, and stem walls and all of that other stuff that uh, this actually can be placed right on the pad that currently exists and it's it's actually set in with anchors they have these drill anchors these four foot drill anchors that they actually put right into the ground there and uh, and if you'll remember this is the site that we currently have the the, uh, the spring cleanup bins that are on, so we've got big trucks constantly moving these these huge trash bins on and off of this site. So we're confident that the soil, that the the ground will take our take the weight of our trucks. So we were we were faced with this this roughly the same expense for 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 renting this as we were buying it but they were going to charge us this significant amount to also take the take the structure down um, the other reason that we are here after we talked about this as a committee is we felt like that this was a little bit outside of the scope of the um, of the bond to actually purchase this with bond money what we were going to do was uh, th this was never, never discussed with the bond that we would actually purchase this continue to own it and use it for another use and so after we talked, uh, we felt like the right thing to do was to come, present this problem to the council, and, uh, and ask for the funds that are, that are available, or the funds to, uh, to make this process possible. Now, in addition to this, the bond money is going to pay for the, uh, about a little over $100,000 worth of work that has to be done on the site. We, um, the, I mentioned the, the living quarters are about $40,000. We need to bring sewer and, and water to the site. We need to be a, bring electrical to the site, and we need to get all of this assembled. We also need to bring communications to the site so that we can dispatch our fire engines. Uh, there are just some infrastructure things that are, going to, um, that are going to take this to a figure that we were kind of counting on. Uh, this, this, for several reasons, um, was outside what we thought we were going to be dealing with, and so um, we're here to we're here to ask for a general fund appropriation. Now we can, I, I, you know, for uh, um, as an option, um, the forty thousand dollars is forty thousand dollars that they will take up front in a contract. They will come back when we're done. They will take the facility down. They will move it to our new facility, and they will put the. They'll move it to our new property and they'll put the thing up. That's what that other $40,000 is for. Um, we're well over a year away from there. So we could do this in two, um, in two swaths. We could do the, uh, the, and, the $137,000 um, if, if, uh, if we wanted to buy the structure and we could put the $40,000 off until the next budget year. Um, we, there are some opportunities we anticipate that we will be uh, once again um, we will be on the wildland circuit this summer um, and we will have revenues from the wildland that, that we may be able to uh, with your approval use for the forty thousand dollars to relocate this facility but the facility will serve us for a long time and it's been a need and it just seems silly to rent something it seems silly to rent something and pay the same amount of money we could pay and, and, and own it, actually own it and be able to put it into service in another location. Yes. So the 65 to set up and take down and 68 to rent, that came to like 198. Yes. So this is less. Yes, this is less. This is a little, if you take all the costs involved, this is, this is actually less. And we were a little stunned by that figure. We feel, um, um, yeah, we, we, we felt like uh, it's a busy time for them and they gave us this figure and said, if you, you know, it's one of those things where we've got plenty of work to do. And uh, so this is the figure. Because when we first talked to him, he told us we could count on about $10 a square foot. His bid was $28 a square foot. So again, we were, we were, uh, we were taken by surprise by, by this particular piece of the relocation. And um, so 
felt it was the best option to come and discuss this with the council. Big question, did we lose the site for spring and fall cleanup? Yes. I guess not, not, the, not the site, uh, we, we just, just, a, yeah, just a small piece of it, but. <laughs> That's just a community site. site yeah. community yes, there, yeah. yes, but it, it is a big site. There's a possibility that we could still do something, so. So, um, I think Mr. Kinnett kind of touched on this a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, so to me, you know, this appropriation doesn't allow us to buy it because it actually costs more to rent. Um, the appropriation is because the, the cost that I think it should have been in the bond um, is substantially more than we estimated it, that it would be. And so uh, the cost of doing this would be substantially more than what we expected. Both this aspect of it as well as the living quarters aspect and the infrastructure aspect. Um, and so this appropriation is, is just because the, the now estimated costs are roughly $180,000 more than we originally estimated. Yes, um, but as we discussed this as a committee, we also felt like using the bond money to purchase this building and to own it, that we needed to have that conversation. We felt like we needed to, to place that out in the light of day. That, that because there was nothing that said that we were going to buy this building and we were going to own it and we were going to take it. So we thought it would be best to have this conversation with you over that. I think the general fund balance can handle this personally, so I would certainly be in favor of it. How much did you have appropriated or uh, uh, anticipated to come out of the bond? We, um, when we looked at all of the numbers, we, we actually had, um, when it came to the relocation costs, the the, the our previous architect built those in and we were at about hundred and forty thousand dollars so if, if you, you took a hundred or so from the from the no. bond you could still effectively capture the rental portion of it and the yeah, rest so of the, the general fund we it is it is our intention to pay for the rest of this out of the bond it would just be this facility this this structure putting it up taking it down and, and moving it that would be outside the bond does the structure as you have it, you talked about adding power and everything else, is that, is that, uh, that's in that set, hundred. is that set up with equipment inside, doors that come up and yeah. down, all the, that kind of stuff? It, it, that's, that's the, that's the electrical and all that. This, this number that you see here are our doors, our automatic openers. It is a fully self-contained apparatus bay that we will then fully, uh, fully self-contained be able to take it and put it up in another location. But this is this is all this is everything to do with the apparatus storage. So. Council members, when I first came to Utah, I went to work for South Jordan City, and they had what we called the bubble. It was a huge structure like this, and for over ten years, the city used a structure like this for its public works facility, including some offices and everything from fleet maintenance to parks and rec to public work to streets and everything else operated out of that building done right, it can be a very good and effective building for the city for a long, long time. And what is the estimated life of the exterior? Is it some kind of white material? Yeah, yeah actually we were going to go with a tan, uh, tan material because it shows the dirt, you know, as after a few years it starts to look a little dirty, we were going to go with a, more of a tan, but it is 15 years. It's warranty for 15 years. And then it can be reskinned, and the reskinning is, uh, I think in this line item, the skinning was twelve thousand dollars for. So, so it, it stands to reason that we could have it reskinned for in fifteen years for, you know, probably by then maybe twenty thousand dollars or so, and have another have another full useful life. Can I just ask the administration comfortable with this request? Yeah, we've as the chief knows we've looked at, looked at every which way to try to figure this out. Uh, all the way from double wides uh, next to a barn uh, to something around uh, this area. We think this is the most responsible, effective way to do it. And, and we have an asset when we get done instead of just liquidating the asset at its conclusion. So it makes sense. Any other questions? Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, don't go anywhere. Please. Nice.
Item number five is a discussion regarding fire department budget requests. So it was thought, I, I, uh, Bryce, Bryce must have looked on his list and found out that I was missing from that from that list. I didn't have an opportunity to, to come and talk to you about our supplemental requests. And so I'm here to talk to you about the two supplemental requests that, uh, that we put in um, and, uh, and kind of where, where we are in the process. Um, is it me, Bryce? Uh, oh, there we go. No? Move it back. Point it that way. Okay. And then hit the left or right. Okay. It's supposed to work. Here. Keeps going backwards. Oh, no. No, we're good. We're good. There's two buttons, I think. I'm pushing the, the forward button. It's just got a delay to okay. okay. All right. I apologize for that. So, if you'll remember, two years ago, I came before you and, and we had asked to begin a, a capital equipment fund. And that, that capital equipment fund was to take some of our major, our major expensive equipment and to, to look at its, its service life divide that by its cost in a few years and tell you what it was going to cost to replace all this equipment when it died so that I would not be the chief standing up here, or there wouldn't be a chief standing up here saying our breathing apparatus system needs to be replaced and we need $450,000 and we need $500,000. So, so we went through the, the, uh, the items and, and this is just an abbreviated list, but the items that uh, we're talking about 